So welcome everyone to the ZPNC stream. I'm PR Abamra and I'll be moderating this session. For this session, we've got Donald Zenit from BMC Software and he'll be talking us through XCF tuning. Um, in terms of uh, session feedback, we'd really appreciate if you can uh, leave it at the end. It really helps us uh, get better at this every single year. The session code is 6BJ and I'll drop a link in the chat box so that you can uh, leave, the, leave the feedback there. We'd also really appreciate if you could kindly donate to our nominated charities, which is RNLI and Guide Dogs for the Blind as well. We're, we're almost at 100% of our target. And, uh, you know, if you've taken any value from any of uh, the free sessions, then we'd greatly appreciate if you could uh, kindly make a donation, big or small, um, it, it would be very uh, well welcomed. In terms of Q&A, please feel free to leave uh, any of your questions, comments, uh, feedback within the chat box, and uh, we'll, we'll get to them um, towards, most likely towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but with that in mind, um, I'll hand it over to you, Donald. Hello, everyone. So um, what I want to talk about is um, XCF tuning, and, and not very many people um, have really paid attention to XCF tuning, but I, I will tell you that uh, about 90% of the customers uh, that I looked at uh, could benefit fairly uh, well from doing a little bit of tuning, and 50% um, uh, configurations were absolutely horrid, and they got you know could get big CPU and response time benefits from doing tuning. So I was presenting this at Share in the US for a number of years and the uh, IBM R&D guys were sitting in the rooms taking notes and um, they decided this was too complicated. So they created XCF automatic tuning um, in ZOS 2.4. And so, uh, you know, automatic, automagic as I call it, uh, always makes me a little leery. Um, so I thought I would, you know, uh, look at a couple of customers going through migration and what happens, you know, uh, in the middle and when it's finally uh, migrated. And um, I had some concerns which really uh, didn't turn out to be true. Um, so um, they actually, one of the things that I had found in, in uh, pre 2.4 in the manually configuring ones, they go, nah, it doesn't work that way. Then they looked at it and they go, uh, yeah, it does. And they fixed it, but only in the automagic. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So. I, I want to talk about some of the, the common mistakes people made that are automatically addressed and um, if, if, how to fix them yourself if you're not 2.4 yet. Um, I want to tell you that it is on by default and it should help 99% of the customers, especially if they haven't done any serious tuning. Um, but you know, what about customers that have tuned it? And what about customers that have um, uh, CA databases, and I'm not picking on CA, but they use very large packets, and uh, most people don't have their system configured for that. Uh, so I want to talk about that. Um, what, well, you know, as I say, what what about customers that have already done some significant tuning? What happens with them, and um, who will automatic work best for, and who should monitor it? So that that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so. One of the things automatic is trying to fix all the common mistakes that I kept on telling that people were making. And, uh, you know, my hypothesis was that it will, you know, work for 95% of the customers, 95% of the time, but I wanted to check out a few concerns. Uh, what about migration uh, mode? What about resource constraint? Because what it does is it automatically takes over all of your definitions and redefines things, but if it's in migration mode, it can't take away all your resources and, and redefine them. So they have, they have to, help ours have to work together. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, what about customers that have a large volume of greater than 16K messages? Because that was not the original design point or the original tuning articles, uh, you know, ex expectation. So I always say, well, you know, why should I care? Um, so let's talk about the impact and if, you're, if it really impacts your site. Um, so back when the last white paper was written by IBM in 2006, the machines were a lot slower. The CF links were a lot slower, but they were fairly fast relative to the CPU. And memory that was expensive and it was a concern to save real memory. Um, now I, I say that that you know the fact that we've been ignoring tuning and that all of those recommendations are significantly outdated, and our CPUs are too fast and expensive to waste uh, CPU cycles. 
Now, some of you may have seen one of my coupling facility uh, presentations or anybody about synchronous spin loop. We're not talking about synchronous uh, activity here. This is asynchronous activity, but it still is using CPU. I think we all know move character long takes more CPU than a move character. Um, so we're moving a lot of data here in many cases, and, and we're charging that back to the XCF address space and to the end user calling address space, and I'll show you how that works later. But we have a lot faster links, and um, you know, just as in the coupling facility tuning, uh, you know, use your fastest links if you want the best response time and the least CPU impact. And you know, XCF workload volume is getting a lot higher with all of the new mobile and web workloads, so it, it's it's time to take another look at it. <clears throat> so there are a lot of XCF users. Uh, Kicks MRO, when I go cross system, I'm going to use XDF, IMS, OTMA Bridge. CA has several databases. GRS, WLM, VTAM Generic Resources. Um, you can get a detailed list by running an RMF or a CMF members report. You'll see who's generating what volume. Um, so this is just a little, you know, picture of, you know, people, uh, you know, making XCF signals. So if I have a TOR on one LPAR and the AORs are another LPAR, I'm going to you know, most likely be using XCF, not IP, to uh, move things if they're in the same sysplex. So <clears throat> what ends up happening, um, this is just a Kix example, there's lots of callers, but um, you know, I make a call from my Kix region um, to give the data to XCF AS, and that happens on my, you know, whatever TCP, um, probably the QR TCP that I do the send from. XCF um, uh, then passes it through the coupling facility to the other LPAR, and then that other LPAR, uh, XCF takes that and passes the uh, data to when he does a call for it uh, via cross-memory SRB. Um, and so a lot of CPU is being charged uh, into Kix. So when Kix moves it and when Kix gets it, there is some overhead that is in XCF. And my estimation, <coughs> is uh, about half of the overhead is in XDF and the other half is in the application. So if you have a very large XCF AS CPU, which a lot of customers do, figure that that same amount um, is also in the calling application. So that'll give you an idea of what potentially you might get back by doing some tuning. Um, so XCF, you know, knows that it's only moving a couple of bytes into a big buffer, but um, the coupling facility didn't know it was moving only a couple of bytes, and that seems to have been addressed in the, in the new uh, release. Um, and I say the excess, some excess CPU of moving small packages in large uh, message sizes has been resolved. And, and what ends up happening is you may have declared, oh, well, I want to use 2K buffers, and he says, well, somebody gave me a 16K packet. I'm going to change the buffer size to 16K. And as long as I have some activity in that, I'm not going to shrink it back down. Um, so <clears throat> this, these are some um, IBM numbers. You know, here is the cost uh, instructions. And, you know, we know uh, all instructions are not equal, but they all cost something. And um, there's a significant increase in the number of instructions required to uh, move data through XCF, which is a very common way of moving things. So we want to reduce the overhead uh, of to doing things that aren't necessary. Um, do I have any XCF traffic? Like I said, you can run an RMF or a CMF report and you can see, so here's all my kicks regions and there's the request to and from. So there is you know, a significant volume. This is a 15 minute interval. There's almost 500,000 uh, requests per LPAR, so a million requests. And um, my, um, uh, I did some benchmarking and I did 1 million uh, coupling facility 4K requests and it was 2% of the CF CPU. So you, you can imagine it's going to have some impact on um, your GCP as well. Again, this is not a spin loop, this is asynchronous request. There is some discussion in XCF about sync versus async and they don't mean the coupling facility request they're making. They're talking about whether they process the entire packet 
in one move request or whether they interleave it with other people's requests. So if you get, I think it's 32K um, size, they're going to break it into multiple pieces. And they have that option on some other sizes, but they don't typically do that. So you're typically doing one big send via an asynchronous call to your coupling facility path. But if you look at this report, there's lots of other things. The unfortunate thing about these reports <clears throat> is they tell you the volume, but they don't tell you the class. So you can get a report by class, you know, small, medium, and large, how many that I move, and you can get an account by user, you know, how many calls that they made. But I don't know if these kicks calls were 4K or 16K, and there's no way to determine that. Um, but I can tell you that in some customers where they've decades ago created dedicated GRS requests, that typically 90% of that traffic is uh, in the 1K packet, but it's ended up expanding that packet because there are definitely adequate intermittent messages that are much bigger. And you're kind of hurting yourself sending all your messages on the big class when 90% of them are 1K. You're better off not having an exclusive class for GRS. And IBM made that recommendation decades ago, but customers are still running the old stuff. So <clears throat> that's why do I care? And, and now let's talk about what people do wrong. And there are others, I've seen all kinds of things that people do wrong, but I'm gonna talk about the ones that I see most frequently. Um, so let's talk about how this really works in the, in, in the first place before we talk about how you can mess it up. <clears throat> so um, there are these idea of transport classes and you define paths and you assign them to the transport classes and you can define CTCs, um, which are very effective for moving 956K bytes and you can define CF um, and it will, XCF will automatically pick the fastest path for the message it's trying to move. It does a very nice job of doing that. Uh, I believe it does something like send gutter balls down all the paths, even the one that's decided were ugly and then see if they get better and they keep track of which path is, is, is the best to use. A lot of the problems come in, in in the customer didn't find enough transport classes or didn't find to find enough paths. Um, and uh, what ends up happening, it's not like we're doing wait on path. The problem is I sent a 16K message in, in a path and now a 1K message is sitting waiting behind it. So um, size changes, um, uh, require cisplex wide negotiation. So if, I'm oh, sorry, I accidentally hit my <coughs> mouse. Um, so if you define the, you're, you're, you know, uh, I've got a nine, a 1K buffer and a 4K buffer, that's all I have. And I get a 16K message, um, XCF says, uh, okay, you guys, we need to have a receive buffer for that. And uh, let's all, you know, decide on that. And we'll all change to 16K, slight hiccup. And then he leaves that around unless he doesn't see a 16K for a long time. So now you're sending all your 1K things in a 16K buffer um, in terms of willing to willing ability to accept and receive it. That's another thing that changed in the, in the new 2.5. All systems are always ready to receive the maximum buffer size and the, the, um, the outbound side can decide what it wants to send it in. It doesn't have to do the sysplex negotiation. Um, so the KPIs that I like to look at is a transfer class percent small and percent big. So, um, you know, percent big, you're only going to see on your um, largest defined class. Percent small, a lot of times people say, oh, I'll just define a 1K and a 32K. And then you look at the 32K and the percent small is 90%. In other words, 90% of the time, you could have fit in a smaller buffer and you're wasting CPU and elapsed time to send things in a bigger buffer. Um, message transfer times um, only happen in the S SMF records and that data is only captured at the end of the interval for the last few things. And um, this is not very representative of reality and the XCF group will tell you that as well. And you can get it on the XCF display commands and you can issue those multiple times in a row for a much better picture. And, and I'll discuss that a little bit more later, but what I would do is, you know, obviously it doesn't work for CTCs, but look at your coupling facility asynchronous service times, min max, standard deviations and all that, uh, instead of the uh, message transfer times. 
And these get a little squirrelier in 2.5, uh, and I'll talk about that later. Um, so we want to look at the number of transport classes, the path, the path busy. Um, and then, of course, we want to look at the uh, coupling facility. We want to look at the asynchronous service time and the standard deviations. And I like to look at the synchronous time for lock structures for, for reference. If I've got a really bad async time, though, I also have a bad sync time because that usually indicates a CF, uh, you know, utilization issue or, or, you know, things like that. If it's only an async, it could very easily be prism entitlement and um, logical process over commit. It's just not getting a chance that the person is supposed to read, uh, uh, you know, we're getting the message, the part doesn't get to read it. Um, and that's discussed further in my coupling facility presentation. Um, look at the CPU utilization, um, look at your link speeds, <clears throat> and look at your coupling facility versus your relative, um, your GCP relative speed. Um, that's typically not an issue these days. In reality, the NEC 12 CF is faster than a Z15, but you can't put the fast links on. So you want to use the, the, the um, CF box level that supports the fastest links because the links are more important than the processor speed. Um, like I say, you know, if you read the 2006 IBM tuning guide, it says, ah, oh, all you need is like a 1K and 4K. Um, <clears throat> and people have gotten around that and they do things like, oh, let's find a 1K and a 32K. Um, in reality, majority, typically close to 90% of your traffic is 1K. And then, um, you know, the next biggest thing is going to be 4 or 8K. 32K, 60, you know, uh, bigger than 32K are typically very small volume, you know, a couple of percent. But if you can have a continuous 2% of very large, it's going to keep your transport class uh, sending that large size. The, the other thing is that I see <clears throat> is um, you have multiple coupling facilities in a sysplex, which you obviously want for DB2 resiliency, et cetera. But then you don't define your coupling facility path symmetrically. So I'll put all my transport class for 1K on one CF and all my transport class for the 32K on the other CF. And one, that didn't give you resiliency, but secondly, it's gonna give you a longer path for all your local same machine. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Uh, it can also, you know, I also see load imbalances on XCF paths. And this is um, really important if, um, you know, I put all my DB2 uh, high volume structures on one CF and the other CF um, has lots of juice and runs XCF right and this CF doesn't run XCF because it's busy doing synchronous requests for DB2. So you need to look at <clears throat> making it available and the big mistake that I see is that, you know, somebody's trying to save a few pennies and they say, can I still use these old CFs on my new processor and IBM C he says, yeah, they're still supported and you don't buy new ones. Um, I personally believe that the new slink, which is not something around, don't quote my, I'm not IBM, I don't have prices, but you know, less than 10K, you need a pair of them, that's 20K a pair, they're gonna pay for themselves in less than three months on CPU savings and MLC costs. So buy the new links. <clears throat> um, there's an, another presentation that is my old presentation that goes into some old issues a little bit, more detail, it's in share from August, 2017. There's also share and I believe um, uh, GSE UK sessions, older sessions on this and coupling facility. Um, so you can go back and look at the GSC. So um, we um, wrote a little driver to just drive messages and you can see um, we, we took <clears throat> and basically, we had a sender receiver. We didn't move the data into the buffer on our in our application. We had the same data loaded all the time, and we just kept on telling us they have to send it back and forth. And you can see the um, CPU time and the SRB time um, of the um, client um, is uh, much higher with the 28k buffer than a, than a 4k buffer. Um, and so there is the percentages on the right. <clears throat> so 
Uh, 61% more TCB on the client, 98% more SRB. If you look at the total, it's 70% more CPU. So this is the reason that you want to make sure that you have paths that will move the correct buffer size. <coughs> so <coughs> uh, my, my little GRS thing popped up too soon, but you can do this command um, on any system and you will get um, you know, real-time information. And you, there are other commands that will display the response time. But this uh, D space uh, class equals all in orange down at the bottom would show them all. I've just, once I did that, I put in a specific class, the, their extra large class. And you can see even in their extra large class that 12% you know, of the 62K messages fit in the 32K transport class. The old IBM rule from 2006 was to give more than 5% of your messages um, that, that fit in uh, a, a class, you might want to create the class. And considering this one double in size, and we saw the CPU differences just on 28K, I would say it's worth having a 32K buffer size. Now, everything in between is fairly low volume. You know, maybe I don't need uh, anything in between like a 48K. <clears throat> um, by the way, all the all of the class lengths are a standard 4K increment minus um, something like 96 bytes. It's always header bytes. So you look at the class length; it's short. So if you actually gave it the num the you know the normal number for 32K, you can you know it's not 32700, but that's the usable size in in a 32K buffer. Um, <clears throat> so. The other thing is that these, 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 when you send it in a 62K buffer, that 62K is page fixed. So you're wasting real memory that you didn't need to waste. You could have done it in a 32K page fixed buffer. And once you define the 32K, um, depending on how big of a gap you have, you may find that they all fit in 16K. Um, so you can do this you know, as an iterative process. Um, by the way, you need to do this on multiple members. I usually do it on a couple of my highest volume talking members. So I've done it on two members here. And you, can, you could have done a, a CD class all, and it would have given you all these stats for all the transport classes, which is a little bit verbose. Um, normally what I do with most of these commands is I issue them, I wait a minute, I issue them, and then I put them in Excel and calculate the deltas to see if, if, if the volume is changing, you know, when I care about response time or when I care about CPU. Now, if you're in tailor fit pricing mode, you care about CPU uh, all the time, um, but I normally try to focus on improving things when my SLAs are impacted or my four hour rolling average is act, uh, impacted. So <clears throat> here's why we can't believe XCF transfer times. Um, it's captured by RMS CMF in the last minute and it uses the last 64 buckets that it has of actual send messages. And you can see that, you know, in, in the last minute of the um, SMF interval at, at, at 1.15, um, there was one outlier that is going to mess up the response time. Uh, that is is responded now. You know what I'm expecting to see. That very first line zero 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 four five. That's normal. That's good. Um, you know that's my target. When I see these other numbers, if they're you know consistent, that's a problem. Um, now you can see there's also another ridiculous number in here that's not skewing anything because my RMF interval collection finished by then. But you you can see that there are skewed numbers that could easily impact <clears throat> what is reported. So I don't usually like to use that. I usually like to use the CF asynchronous service times, which is actually the total service time divided by the you know, number of samples and you get an actual average service time and those standard deviations, et cetera, et cetera. So I would look at this. If, if, if these numbers look funny, you can say, yeah, that's not very likely to be true because my standard deviation is nowhere near that. So I mentioned I was going to talk about CF links and I was going to talk about um, CF balancing. So let's look, I, I don't know why I have it right to left, but let's look at the side two CPC two first. So if I want to talk between LPAR A and LPAR C on CPC two, 
and I have an ICF or, or a coupling facility in the same physical building, short, short distant link, I can get high performance communication between these two LPARs, okay? But when I wanna go over to the other CPC, I obviously have to go to a coupling facility external to me, right? And that link may be slow, <clears throat> that distance could be long, and it's gonna take a lot longer. So I have seen customers, even in England, where their coupling facility is uh, GDPS, you know, you know uh, very far away from the machine that wants to move it. And it makes no sense to move data between LPAR A and LPAR B via a coupling facility that is physically remote when they have a coupling facility here. So you need to make sure that you define a path for every size on every coupling facility so that there's one close to you and XCF will automatically pick the closest one. <clears throat> so, Automagic to the rescue, um, I'm almost halfway through. So we talked about, you know, what are the problems? I'm gonna talk about what it's fixing and it, it does fix a lot. So um, the first thing that IBM, um, and this is, you know, pretty much, you know, what the words were in their in their uh, chair presentation is their their objective was simplification, eliminate configuration and tuning burden, avoids all the manual effort, and as they readily admitted, the RMF info is inadequate to do the tuning. You need to do those deep display commands because nowhere in the SMF record is my my details of the FIS statistic. It just says, yep, you had you know. X percent small, but it doesn't say how small, which I showed you that, you know, the majority of them were half the size of the buffer with the, with the XCF display command. Uh, avoid outages and slowdowns, sysplex resiliency. A lot of people, as I point out, they don't configure the paths to go to the right place. What, what new Automagic does is it takes all over all your path definitions that are available to it and it reuses them it, as it sees best fit. Um, it also tried to deal with erratic response time um, because before you didn't know if you had ill-behaved uh, members or bursts in activity or large messages, et cetera, and it does a better job of managing the traffic by managing all the paths. So we can say, oh, you only had one path for 16K, but right now I need more than 1K, one path for 16K. Um, you know, avoided the issues of static definitions. They don't adapt, your workloads have changed. I mean, I don't know the last time you, you looked at your XDF or changed your definitions, but I bet you it was years ago and your workloads, you know, someone probably has ZOS Connect and all kinds of things have changed since the last time you played with this. And you can inefficiently uh, allocate resources. You, you know, you can have excess storage used by excess buffers. Um, most people don't understand the max message parm. I don't think I'm gonna go into it in detail here, but it is not the maximum number of messages. It is the number of 1K buffers to assign to the transport class. So when you assign 2000 to the 1K size, you get 2000 messages, right? But when you assign 2000 to the 4K message, you get one fourth as many, right? When you go to the 64K, you hardly get any number of messages that you can send based on the number of buffers. So <clears throat> everything's automatic now. You don't have to worry about that. But um, if you go and do display buffers on most people's systems, they're not, you know, using anywhere uh, near the amount that they've allocated until you get to the larger sizes. So large message claims, XCF will intermix signals on managed path, best fit buffers will you be used on this end size, optimize should use fewer buffers than what you were doing before. <clears throat> Paths are, are uh, maximum signal size used, never need to renegotiate or tune the signal paths. Okay. Because it's always ready to receive the max buffer size. So <clears throat> this is a, a very large customer's data. Um, and I looked at um, before and after, and um, what what I saw the um, was that only one system um, was using similar, and it wasn't a high volume system. But and after all the systems um, were making better use of their uh, buffers, so that appeared to be um, true. So what happens when I'm in the middle of migration? Uh, 
um, you know, I, um, I've got some, you know, systems doing automatic and some not. And uh, one thing I, I, I mentioned GRS briefly, but if you define paths and you allocate them to a specific name for a specific user, security, GRS, anything, uh, XCF automatic will not take over those paths. So um, that is, you know, a missed opportunity in, in, in as far as I'm concerned, unless you define something for extra large, you know, to keep it out of the way of everybody else. So if you have one for a database that uses 32K buffers, you know, maybe you want to keep that. But um, the rest of the things you thought you were doing GRS a favor, you're actually hurting it by having a dedicated class name. <clears throat> um, if you do a display on it, you will see that he is sending messages bigger than 1K. And, there, and whatever the biggest size that he's moving, that's the size that he's using for the transport class. Just, be, just before I got into migration, I don't think it's so, I say on the very first sentence. So XCF um, uses transport class that do not have a group name, GRS, RACF, you know, WLM, whatever you wanna do. Um, you shouldn't be doing any of those, um, but people did those in the past. So if you, most customers don't have those and anything that doesn't have an explicit group will now automatically be stolen. <clears throat> Um, and I, I assumed that, you know, the shared pass would have additional contention and erratic uh, response time from old, uh, large with new, more efficient. And, and that didn't really true, turn out to be true. <clears throat> um, now, one of the things that um, the way you look at statistics, uh, things look differently um, on the old and the new. Um, in the, in the old case, um, uh, all the messages came back and, um, you know, came back default and you didn't know where they were coming from. And now it's kind of reversed the way things look. So XCF managed transport class um, will we'll share the coupling facility pass to uh, communicate with others ZOS 2.4 uh, LPARs. So here, um, I'm talking from DB2, which is a um, new 2.5 image to um, other LPARs that are not. So within DB2B to DB2B um, internal usage, I'm using the new stuff, but I'm using the old stuff, my def small um, to talk to my, uh, from DB2B um, to DB2A via this IXC list. So uh, the user defined transport classes are still used um, to communicate to the older systems. And you'll notice the path name is the same. And that's what I didn't realize. I thought when he stole it, he was going to steal it and leave me with scraps, but we're both using the same path and he knows whether it's old or new. Um, transport class reporting differences. Um, pre 2.4, uh, all of your uh, inbound transport class, it just said blank. You had no idea what was coming in. You just knew it came back to you. Um, but the outbound transport classes all had names. You could see exactly what they went out on, you know, small, medium, large. In ZOS uh, 2.4, um, I've got one. Um, inbound transport class name and one outboard transport class name. And the outboard class um, is XCF managed where before the out was the size. And now the in inbound is the path name and you know what path was defined for. Now there is a um, ADM A level. This is pretty old news for us now. Um, return at least uh, returns original transaction class associated with the inbound path and the um, outbound XF instead of path name. So we start seeing uh, things where I can see that it, it's outbound on def small, outbound on XCF managed. Um, outbound, so you can see XCF improves utilization of sizes. Um, majority of 956 is sent on the def small path. So it doesn't, uh, need to um, use wrong sizes. Well, as I 
said, well, what about large messages? Um, as you, rem you remember, um, you know, the bigger the message size, the more CPU it takes. And again, this was, um, you know, done with an, a um, driver program that just takes a buffer of this size and just to send receive, you know, a couple thousand times. And I measured the CPU for the job. So um, it, I'm putting the same, you know, 1K of data in the buffer and I'm just saying, you know, go, go do this. Um, and, uh, you know, similar results for other size ranges between there, you know, but this, it's starting to get smaller of a difference. And we have the same, you know, CPU impact that we talked about before, but now I have a lot more sizes to show you. So we don't want to use sizes bigger than what we need to send the messages. So like I say, old rule of thumb from 2006, create a new transport class if it could be used by 5% of the traffic. Um, you know, in this particular case, um, this um, buffer message, big messages with 17% were bigger than 956. Um, so I needed, I, I need another class. Uh, customers do silly things. I have had customers that's the only size that they define, but it's not that common, but it is pretty common to see 1K and 4K are the only ones they define. And then the 4K is made bigger and, um, you know, you got a large percent small. Um, XCF managed large message claims. CF overhead of small messages in a large class is eliminated. Uh, this is from the R&D developer. He told me he found what I was saying and it's gone. I go, did you fix it in the old code? He goes, nope. I go, okay. Um, so XCF overhead of large uh, percent big or small is reduced from what it used to be. So here is um, old response time, and this is the structures, not the XCF number that I said is, you know, has standard deviation issues, outlier issues. And you can see that, you know, we consistently have better coupling facility and response time improved. Um, this could be from lower utilization on the coupling facility. This could, you know, because we're moving smaller buffer sizes in general could be from what the actual takes to move. I don't know, but you can see that my line, which goes straight across here, uh, is <clears throat> exceeded consistently in the before image. And the, the low marks for some of these are significantly below the lowest marks of any of them on the left. So this is going to save response time and CPU to use XCF managed path, unless you've you know, done significant tuning. And even if you've done significant tuning, you still have the coupling facility, the move issue from when things are decent fit, but not perfect fit. fit. Um, um, did I see a CPU drop? Um, I'm, this graph is uh, a graph of uh, XCF address space CPU against uh, total signal volume and um, I, I'm, I'm graphing input and output here as the two different line colors. Um, and, you know, input output moves pretty much in, in sync in terms of number of calls. That doesn't mean that we're moving the same size buffer. I could make a 4K request from Kix to another Kix region and get back, you know, a, a 4K buffer. It just tell me the volume. But the CPU uh, is tracking with the volume. <coughs> uh, this is a before image. Um, uh, and this is an active. Uh, an after image, and I didn't see, uh, you know, it, you know, it's slightly lower, um, but at a different time of the day, um, it was slightly higher. So I don't, you know, I'm just looking at times when I have similar volumes and look at similar CPU. So um, I'm saying the jury's out on this one based on this one customer case, that, and, and these are probably a lot bigger. Uh, call counts than you're going to see. So it, it, it's probably pretty representative um, that XCFAS, which doesn't have all the CPU, isn't seeing um, the savings. But we did see a coupling facility improvement. So I'm saying that automatic XCF, uh, automatic um, management improves when your classes were not well-defined in the original configuration, as in you have only a few 
with a lot of small percent and then uh, you know showing up and you have a, a, an extra large one. Um, large sizes in the original configuration uh, that weren't necessarily accounted for. Um, you know, now you're going to have multiple paths um, by size that can be taken over. So sharing is going to have choices. He's going to decide where to use those paths based on what he's dynamically doing. Um, and I'm seeing transfer times are more erratic than they were before because he's changing things on the fly and some things may not be used as much. And um, if they're not used, they may have because they, they had bad response time. But uh, that's just an observation. I'm not saying that the actual response times are worse. I'm just saying that the ones that get recorded are worse. So I recommend that you know you ensure best fit. You can still do the display commands and look what messages you're using, and you can see at a glance here um, that the majority of the messages um, are 956, but 4K is pretty prevalent, and in this customer's case, 32K. Um, and they have a significant number of outliers at 62K. So I would say that certainly in a before image, you want all of those sizes, 1K, 4K, 32K, and 62K defined to you. Um, um, and, and I'm saying, you know, define the common sizes. Make sure you have enough paths to support the number of dynamic ones that you want. So I want one, two, three, four. You know, I need at least four paths if he's going to do magic for me. Um, so you, he only can do magic with what you give him. If you give him two paths, he can only use two paths. Um, and, you know, you could do a, a, a define a large size and designate it to group my app one. Like I say, if you had a, a database, for example, that needed a 32K buffer. Um, IBM disagrees with that recommendation, just so you know. So, uh, but I think they're going to agree 100%. Make sure you have enough classes and paths to find that it can steal from them and use them appropriately. So, thank you, grazie, grazie, obrigado, ciao. I could say a few more, but uh, that's it. Hopefully, you know. Um, that helps you at least say, maybe I should take a look at this because I could get some better response time and some CPU savings. So um, most of XCF traffic is going to be in um, the online window. And so if your four hour rolling average peak is in the online window, I would think you would want to um, look at it. If you're having SLA issues with, you know, kicks and you have your kicks defined or cheat, you no, know, you guys use, use kicks, Hersley kicks. Um, uh, you know, with a TOR sending things to AORs and other LPARs, um, you might want to look at this. And if you're tailor fit pricing, every CPU second counts. So I finished early. Um, I originally had a one hour presentation on the old way, and um, I went to share and did a magic presentation only, and it was a half hour. And I tried to merge the two to get them to be an hour, but I had plenty of time for QA. Thanks very much, Donald. Um, if anyone's got any questions, comments, feedback, please uh, please do leave it in the chat box and uh, we'll give it a few seconds uh, for anything to come through. Thanks very much, John, for tuning into the sessions. Really, really appreciate your support. So it doesn't look like there's anything in the chat window. Um... No, nothing coming in at the moment, but... Um... Yeah, I, th I think we can uh, we can give everyone fifty minutes back of their uh, back in their uh, calendar. But thank you so much, uh, Donald, for this presentation. Really appreciate it. Very um, very insightful and informative. Um, as a reminder to everyone that's tuned in, please feel free to uh, leave some feedback. It will be very helpful. I've left a link in the chat box, and also um, uh, do donate to a nominated charity as well. We'd really uh, Really appreciate that. If anyone does want to follow up uh, separately with Ronald, then um, you can do that as well, or feel free to get in touch with me directly as well. And I'll, I'll also try and my best to answer any questions or put you in touch with um, anyone that you like. But um, I think this this pretty much is the end of 
GSE. We're on the Thursday. Thanks for um, all your support for tuning into the sessions. Um, hope to see you next year in person. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, thanks once again, Arnold, for, for this presentation. And, and I didn't put it on here because it wasn't in the template, which made me forget it, but it's Donald underscore Zunert at dmc.com. Yeah. Oh, All right. Just, uh, there you go. I'll put it in the chat so if anyone wants to copy and paste it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think we can end it there then. Okay, thank you. Take care.